How's it going, everybody? And welcome back to the Stupid Questions podcast. Today on the pod, we're going to be talking with Luke McKenzie. He is the founder and CEO of Win Republic. They make amazing triathlon gear. This is not a paid ad. I am getting ready to buy one of them and hopefully be racing in it for this 2024 season. Um, yeah, Luke is just an amazing guy. Obviously, a really neat company, but we dive into who he is as a person, as you know, what this podcast is all about. And we talk about his family. We talk about him being a father. Uh, we talk about his dad. We talk about obviously about the company and how he met Beth and so many other things. So without further ado, I want to introduce you to Luke McKenzie. Giveaway alert. This episode is brought to you by Synergy Wetsuits, and today we have a giveaway from them. We are giving away the Synergy Transition Triathlon bag. So this bag is crafted using premium, lightweight, and durable fabrics. The Synergy Triathlon Transition Bag is built to withstand the demands of rigorous training and races. The innovative wet and dry zones allow you to easily store and transport wet items without worrying about moisture damaging your dry gear. Stay organized with the customizable main compartment that can accommodate various shapes and sizes, while the adjustable front helmet pocket ensures a snug fit for your helmet. For um, this giveaway, if you want to enter it, follow the simple steps on our Instagram page to enter and boost your chances by sharing with friends. Giveaway will be running from May 27, that is today, to June 7. Winners will be announced on Instagram on June 7th. So make sure to go check out that bag giveaway. Well, Luke, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Uh, it's an honor to have you on. It's been neat doing this journey and getting to talk with a lot of, the, obviously, the professional triathletes, which you are from that world as well, but also the entrepreneur side. So I'm super stoked to have you on and hear your story and hopefully dive into some win stuff and your career stuff and yeah. all of that. Looking forward to it. Thanks for yeah, having me. For sure. Uh, so the first question, I don't know if you've listened to any of the past episodes. Yeah. Okay. So you might know the first question that's coming. Um, but the first one is, who is Luke? Or Yeah, who is Luke McKenzie? I'm sorry. Yes, I wrote Kyle in my notes. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I was like, wait a second. I'm having an yeah, old man not moment. Kyle, not Kyle. Yeah. Um, Luke, so uh, first and foremost, I'm a dad, a, a proud father of two young girls, Win and yeah. Marlo, husband to my wife, Beth, uh, a son, you know, I'm a very family oriented man, yeah. uh, son to Peter and Vicky, uh, and brother to my sister, Jackie. Okay, nice. Yeah. So tell me about growing up, uh, you obviously are from... Australia? Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I grew up in Australia, a uh, country boy. Grew up in a little town called Tari, which is about three hours north of Sydney. Sure. Uh, so, yeah, my childhood, um, I guess it was very sports orientated ever since mm -hmm. I was a kid. And that was probably because my father, especially, was very entrenched in the local uh, sports community there, whether it was football or cricket or any kind of team sports he was sure. like very heavily involved with in the community mm -hmm. so yeah i mean i remember my childhood just essentially just being on the sidelines of of his football games or yeah. just following him around but then obviously you get to an age which i guess my girls are at that age now where you are able to sort of start to dive into these you know opportunities and and sure. test the waters of what's which what direction you're going to go and you know i started yeah. out in team sports and quickly found that um you know i wasn't anything of any childhood prodigy that was gonna that make it big on any sports team sure. but i definitely found my niche in uh more individual sports and uh, started out swimming okay. running um even water polo i guess that was a team sport that i was quite good at but um yeah eventually led to triathlon yeah. So swimming, you started off pretty young. Was that something kind of just offered through school or something that your parents influenced getting you into? Yeah. My parents were involved with the local swimming club. And so mm -hmm. I think my sister and I started swimming around the age of six or seven. Okay, um, and that was something that, you know, I think it was, it was a big community thing for us when we were kids, you know, a lot of, a lot of the country kids, I think, you know, they, um, it was a, a it was a very important part of your childhood to at least learn to swim, um, mm -hmm. growing up on a, in a coastal town, coastal environment. And the culture was, yeah, just if you weren't, um, if you weren't at school, you were generally at the beach. And yeah. so, um, we were involved in junior lifeguards as well, which we call nippers in Australia, which is something nippers, that, 
you know, my girls are really involved in now, uh, okay. now they're of age. So I think that they're, they're the things that, you know, I fondly remember as a kid that really got, you know, my love of sport and I guess ultimately led me to triathlon too with, I guess, the skill sets that I picked up along the way through swimming, um, you know, running at, running track and cross country and things like that at school. Yeah. So the individual sports or team sports, there's a lot of overlap, I think, in things that you could draw lessons from that really transfer over to the entrepreneurial or business side of the world. So I'm curious, did you, now looking back on your life when you were younger, do you notice any entrepreneurial tendencies? Did that run in the family? Was this something that you found on your own? I think so. I think, well, the ironic thing is I, a lot of pro triathletes ultimately end up being coaches and my dad is actually a lifelong coach. He's not only, uh, you know, been uh, captain coach of, of football teams, but, um, you know, since I took on the, the sport of triathlon, he's also got into triathlon coaching and has, um, you know, for at least for the last 20 years since I've been involved with the sport, maybe 25 years, has been coaching. So, um I think that um, sense of leadership, I think, has been something that I've sort of drawn a lot from him hmm. uh, and watched him progress over the years in his coaching roles. And, you know, you would think that maybe I would potentially go down that route as well. And, and after my career, go into into that kind of uh, into that area of our sport. But, you know, I've always loved trying new things. And I think, you know, ultimately it led me to creating a business within the sport that um, you know, that I was quite passionate about. And I, you know, I think meeting Beth over here, I think we might get into that a little bit later, but, you know, that was something that I was able to, you know, I was, you know, we essentially joined, joined forces and we had strengths in different areas that both combined to you know, create that uh, opportunity for ourselves. So I think that, you know, I, you know, coming from a team sports background, I think now, you know, now I'm in the leadership role of a of a business. I think there's definitely some parallels you can draw from that. Um, sure. I was, like I said, I was not by no means a, a great team sports player. So I was never in a leadership role. But I guess given that this is my company, I've sort of been thrust into that since, yeah. uh, you know, I established it in 2017. But uh, it's something that I'm really embracing and enjoying. And uh, I love... Um, growing our company, uh, bringing on mm -hmm. new staff and, and seeing where we can go with it. So yeah, I guess it, it does come full circle in a way. Yeah. So I've noticed and observed that there's, this is an overgeneralization, but two types of leaders. There's the type that consider themselves or find themselves pretty extroverted and charismatic and they're seeking leadership. And then there's the others that are a little bit more introverted. Oftentimes I would argue some of the best leaders in the world and they usually don't want that position. So do you fall within one of those two categories? Yeah, I, I would probably, I'd probably put myself in the latter. Like I think given that I guess Beth and I both co-lead the brand in, in a sense, and mm -hmm. we both have our areas of leadership. Uh, you know, obviously she's comes from a marketing, uh, marketing background. And so she can, she can really lead the ship there. She loves the design aspect. She can really lead that um, element of the business, you know, sure. where I'm, uh, you know, I hang my hat within the business is probably more, uh, the product development, um, working with the athletes, how we're, uh, leveraging our relationships with our partners and things like that. And so I think, you know, combined that leadership really is uh, split between both of us. And I think that's where I'm sort of more comfortable, uh, I would say sitting under Beth's leadership as well in, in many mm. regards. Yeah, for sure. So I want to ask a question about Beth then, um, and we'll go to the into the how you met her in a little bit. But yeah. because of where the conversation's flowing, I'm curious with who Beth is now and who you are now. And when you met her, would she have been like, let's just say, when you were back? I don't. How old were you when you met her? Actually, so we met just over ten years ago, end of 2012. So yeah, I guess. What would I have been then? I would have been just on 32, 33 years old, okay. something like that. Yeah. So if you would have met Beth when you were, let's say, 18 to 22, do you think that you would have been interested in Beth or she in you at that time? Ab absolutely not. And that's something that I think she would totally agree as well. I mean, yeah. she didn't really pick up the sport until she was 28. Okay. Um, and, you know, she's uh, she comes from a very... Uh, 
her background definitely comes from a very well-educated family uh, and she was very entrenched in her college, mm. um, you know, doing double degrees and, and things like that. Um, yeah. Whereas, you know, as soon as I was able to leave school, I was out traveling the world racing triathlon. And so um, I guess she came into the sport a lot later than me. And I, you know, it, it was lucky that our mutual love for the sport of triathlon brought us together. But had it been... 10 years earlier, she wasn't even doing the sport and she probably wouldn't have even shown an interest in a guy like myself. So yeah. 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 That's super interesting. So you were 32. So I'm 31 right now. And I'm curious because I know that like in the past three or four years or so, I've really kind of just changed frontal lobe development, if that's what we want to call it. Um, I think that's kind of what science points toward. So as you grew into that, do you remember, can you recall some of the things that like really set you into who Luke was as a man and like became as a man? Yeah, I think I, I guess I had a real sense of independence quite early because like I said, I, uh, my parents, they were never pushing me towards this ultimate dream of, of doing triathlon professionally. I mean, but mm. they afforded me the opportunity to go do it from a very young age by exposing me to it. And, be, yeah. and I was around it from a very young age. So, um, you know, we, we, my love of triathlon started out from going out to the local Ironman in Foster in Australia. And we were volunteers on one of the aid stations there when I was oh, cool. eight, nine years old. Yeah. So being around it from that young age, like I, I just idolized those guys. And so um, growing up through my teenage years and, and finally delving into the sport of triathlon, I could see a pathway to making a career out of it, um, to be able to travel the world and bring me to the pl- to places all around the world and uh, that, um, you know, I saw as, you know, something highly appealing to a, a kid from the country in Australia. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, when I was able to, I think 16 or 17 was my first trip away. Um, you know, I just went to Europe by myself. My parents got me a credit card, which I think I maxed out on my trip to, to <laughs> Europe for the first time when I was 16. Nice. But um, yeah, I was just, I guess I started young and I and had to, I guess, I wouldn't say fend for myself, but I think that that those were the years where it was, you know, you had to make it through those years mm. and grind through those years where you're just getting your butt kicked as a as a newbie pro against, mm-hmm. you know, uh, like a young kid essentially against a, a fully grown uh, adult worldly triathlete. I think, yeah, uh, yeah it was it was eye opening, but it was definitely what formed me in those younger years for sure. Yeah. What was the the transformation or just the mindset shift like for when you were younger? So you're you're getting into this sport, you're realizing, oh, I have some talent. You're beating probably a lot of people local races, and you're kind of at the top of the totem pole. Then you take your elite license, and then it's kind of starting over again. So what kind of mental tax or mind shift did that that play for you? Yeah, it was an interesting period around that end end of high school, sort of transitioning, you know, trying to figure out where what the next steps in life would be. And, um, you know, I finished third in the World Junior Championships in 2001. And the next logical step was like, okay, well, this next year, you're going to go into the pros. And so um, I was racing ITU uh, Olympic distance style triathlon at that stage. And uh, as soon as I stepped foot in the pro realm, I was, I mean, I went from being the top of the junior pack, um, and I was mid pack at best in the, in the, in the pro racing at that, mm-hmm. in that genre of triathlon. Uh, but I soon found, you know, a, a home in coming here to the States because there was a really strong Olympic distance non-drafting scene at the time here in the mm-hmm. States. And so, uh, as a 20 year old coming over to the States, I was lucky enough to to be surrounded by some of Australia's best uh, pro athletes at the time that were mm-hmm. based over here as well. Mm-hmm. So Craig Alexander, McKeeley Jones, yeah. Chris McCormack, they're all over here doing their thing. And I think took a little took a shine to the young kid from Australia that was giving it a go. And yeah. and they, they definitely took me under my wing. I, I definitely have to thank them for that and showed me the ropes. You know, I think that's one of the things that. Um, you know, I'd like to think that I was able to do later in my career as well is I think, you know, you, you've got to 
help that next generation mm. uh, to, to get that leg up. And, and they definitely have afforded me that. And so just being here and being around them and watching how they did it and just training day in, day out with those guys really formed those early years of pro racing. And it was tough. There was times where uh, I was yeah, I was racing the best guys in the world and um, trying to make a paycheck just to stay here in the States before you know, before I had to fly back to Australia, you know, so yeah. there was times where I'd ring my dad and be like, got no money left, dad, I've got to come home. He's like, no, nah, stick in there for one, one more race, one more race. And, you know, sh- sure yeah. enough, a paycheck had come in and I'd stay for another month or two, but yeah, um, it wasn't easy. And I think yeah. that, you know, it's probably those, those years of grinding that probably make the, you know, once you do start to, to make it in the sport, make it worthwhile. Yeah. So how long did it take from the time you took your elite card till you're like, okay, I can, I don't know if comfortable is the right word to use because I'm not yeah. sure if that ever really became a thing, but you got to a point where like, you're not having to sweat and it's every month. Yeah. Well, I, I, I could, I could definitely say those first few years were like that. You know, I'd save up my, save up my money when I was back in Australia, I'd work part-time jobs mm-hmm. and, you know, I was always obviously, obviously training full-time. So I'd have to take things like night jobs, like delivering pizzas or um what were some of the other jobs i did um delivering junk mail and stuff like that just yeah. like things to like just to bring in some income so you know i could live yeah. but also save some cash to to get back over here to the states and you know i also by coming back you know i showed my intent on you know i wasn't just coming here once and seeing how it goes i was coming back year after year and i, yeah. I guess i started to build a little portfolio of sponsors here in the states uh, I found the races that worked for me and, you know, that I knew that I could perform at and I could target. Um, yeah. And then I guess I got to a stage two. That's around the time where the 70.3 uh, series actually started okay. back around 05, maybe I'd say 05, 06. Mm-hmm. And so this whole new genre of racing really sort of boomed. I mean, there was, there was a bunch of half Ironman distance races, I, I, I guess they were called back then, but then once this 70.3 series kicked off, it was something that, you know, I was able to then move into and have some relatively uh, decent success quite early before it became the, the juggernaut that it is now, I guess. But um, those were the years where, you know, I, I started to be able to put some money aside and um, started to be able to think about, you know, how could I reinvest this money in myself or, mm. you know, actually make a living at, out of it. So yeah. it definitely took three or four years of coming back and just getting my head kicked Beating. in to, yeah. to like, so I finally <laughs> made it. Yeah. So who was the first sponsor that uh, gave Luke like the, I guess the permission to like take some free stuff and start pushing you on that? My very, train? very first sponsorship. I remember my dad um, rang Smith sunglasses on my, okay. my behalf. I got some Smith Sunnies and Orca wetsuits at the time, gave me a wetsuit and uh, a race suit for the season. So that oh, was, sweet. I think, in 1998 or 1999. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I think, you know, for those first few years, there are obviously deals that, you know, product, you know, was hard to come by and you were very appreciative of getting a free pair of Sunnies or, yeah. you know, eventually it was bikes. And and funny story, the, the first time I came over to the States in, I think 2000 or 2001, I came over here with just a road bike to race the, the uh, what was then, I guess, pre-lifetime series, but it was a bunch of non-drafting Olympic distance races. And, oh, yeah. Uh, McKeeley Jones just looked at me and said, you're going to get your butt kicked on that thing. And so she gave me one of her giant bikes out wow. of her garage to use for the season. Wow. So in a way, I guess McKeeley was one of my first bike sponsors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shout out. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's neat. Do you still have that bike or did you have you since oh, part no. of it? Um, um, you know, it's long gone, um, yeah. unfortunately, because I would love to have kept that. Um, yeah. Some good memories and, you know, winning, uh, you know, very local, but, um, you know, my, some of my first decent paychecks that came here in the States with one on that bike. And actually I did my first Ironman on that bike in Bustledon in 2004. Oh, wow. That must've hung around for a little while. Yeah. Got some good use out of it. Yeah. And it was carbon, I'm assuming one of the earlier. I, I think so. Yeah. yeah. It was like, it was pre like the Trinity or whatever it is now. Yeah. It was, 
whatever they had in 2004, yeah, it was, I mean, by today's standards, it was nothing special. But yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. to me back then, it was like, this thing's amazing. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Our bike tech has come a long way. And, yeah, yeah like the boy from, the, from country Australia thought he was killing it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. So yeah. you said that was in the 90s. So I read um, just on your website that you were had your hand in, I guess, testing new materials, whether wind tunnel testing or whatever, aerodynamic testing, um, since that time period. Can you talk about that and then how that started to kind of, I guess, turn over the wheels inside your own mind to what would eventually become Win Republic? Win Republic, yeah, yeah. I guess. Um, so that relationship with, um, you know, Pete Coulson was McKeeley's husband at the time was uh, a coach that, you know, he he had mentored and had been around for a long time uh, in that in the space here in the States and Mm -hmm. brought in a lot of the Aussie uh, athletes under his wing. And uh, that was something that I think I knew from, from day dot, you know, you always had to be on the best equipment, um, testing the waters with what was the next best thing. And um, yeah, especially around that time, you know, we're talking now into the 2011, 2012, when things started to really um, probably ramp up another notch. Um, yeah, I just got quite involved with and intrigued by, um, what went into everything that I was using that, you know, what marginal gains could I make? And Mm -hmm. I think they were, they were things that, um, you know, I was training very heavily with Craig Alexander, you know, around the times where he was, he was winning Kona in, in that era. And we, we just knew that, you know, those were the things that made, made the difference. So Mm -hmm. we were looking for the the marginal gains and um yeah so when it came to racing Kona in 2013 um you know I was very adamant to my sponsor at the time Saucony that I needed to have a an aerodynamic suit because the suit that they were wanting me to race in was a two-piece um singlet style short style and I just knew that that era was over like it was time for for tri kits to to evolve. And I'd, I'd started to see like little pieces of it coming together. Like the, the year before, if you recall, Marino Van Hanaka wore a suit similar to the, to that. And from that point, I knew that that was going to be the next sort of, um, you know, the next evolution. And Mm -hmm. so I think I was probably one, the one that probably brought it to more prominence when I came second in Kona that year. And, you know, we went from having, two or three of us wearing those sleeve suits to almost yeah, the entire field come 2014 were wearing aerodynamic sleeve suits. So, um, yeah, that period of time was just, uh, you know, it was, it was a big leap forward. Um, but you know, now I look back in hindsight, it was still quite primitive to where we are even now. Like, uh, mm-hmm. we've got, uh, Daniel Backligard staying with us at the moment. I was just looking over his equipment at, at our house and um it's come a long way even in the few short years since i've retired and so yeah. i think you know that's where the sports is constantly evolving and i think mm-hmm. that there's always something to be had in in searching for that next best thing mm. so i'm curious during that time period because was triathlon known to be trailing in i guess in cycling apparel like the cycling world like during that time period where were the tour riders wearing full pea suits and then the time trialist wearing like the sleeved all the way to the ankle or to the cuff. And it, was- it probably was around the time where you started to notice that the cyclists were starting to wear less of the baggy sort of flappy jerseys. And they were starting to wear something that I, I guess resembles more of what they're wearing today. But um, no, I think the, the issue we had in triathlon, it was just, it was the way that it was always done and no one had really, I'm not saying that I was the one that did it, but it just had always been that way and had been passed on generation to generation. You know, before that, it was essentially the budgie smugglers and the, yeah. the, the small crop tops, you know, and then I guess the, the tri shorts came in. But yeah, it was just natural evolution, I think. And um, yeah, it, it's exciting to see where it can go. I mean, it's, um, you know, we always say that I guess maybe we're at our ceiling, but. We, we never are. I mean, I know in 10 yeah. years' time what we're creating as a Win Republic tri it would be, you know, Absolutely. Far, vastly different to what it is today. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, so then that was 2013. Then in four years, like you're launching or you're coming up with the eventual creation and launch of Win Republic. So what was yeah. what led you to that tipping point to make that jump? Yeah. Well, I guess after 2013, um, you know, I was able to bring on some quite large sponsors that I guess were wanted to bring me on board with product development. Uh, and one of those was Endura, which was at the time really wanting to get into the the triathlon space. They'd, they're a apparel brand out of Scotland that really wanted to uh, break into the tri market and they wanted to create the fastest tri suit. And so, um, you know, I had a lot of feedback and input uh, in the development of those suits. And even still to this day, the suit that we developed back then in 2014, 2015, is still regarded as one of the faster suits. And so I guess just during that time, my, you know, during the development process, working in the wind tunnels, working with the aerodynamicists, um, it was something that I grew to love and I, I yeah. was passionate about. And, uh, you know, as, you know, as all sort of sponsorships and partnerships um, come and go, I think once, you know, it, was, it didn't get renewed in twenty. 17 and so i had an opportunity to decide you know what where i was going to go with my apparel and um yeah i had this crazy idea i I pitched to beth i said let's let's start an apparel company and she went with it yeah yeah so then let's take a pause on that then and let's go to how you met beth and then we'll come back to this point yeah no it's a good one um yeah i i was um well if we want to go right way back I yeah. think, you know, I I was living here in San Diego since 2001, I think. And okay. so I'd, I'd been living here for a long time, but uh, on and off. I was doing the summer here, uh, summer back in Australia. So I was a very nomadic lifestyle. Um, I, you know, had spent time over here with the previous partner, my, my ex-wife, and raced here and lived here for quite a period of time. But... Um, there was eventually a point where we separated and I felt quite lost and mm. I, you know, w- I had the decision to make like, where, where am I going to live? And yeah. I'd always loved it here in San Diego. And, um, so yeah, I decided to hunker down here and I was living and training out of here, um, in early summer of 2013. Um, and I happened to come across Beth. There was a race down at uh, Fiesta Island where triathlon actually was born. Um, It was like a super sprint style race. And we'd both been invited to this race, but we were both, I guess, hung our hat in the long course space. So we were there against, I remember Katie Zafiris was there for the women and Mm -hmm. Ben Canute was there for the men. And I had no business being there. I'm not fast enough. But I was it's a race. Let's go do it. And Beth was there. And, um, you know, she, she lived in North County, San Diego. And, you know, I was, I was just renting or staying with a friend at the time, actually. I said, I really want to get back up to Encinitas. I love it up there. I'm looking for a place to rent right now. And she actually knew of a place where I could rent. Um, and so put me in contact with the, with the guy. And, um, it happened to be just quite close to her, maybe like half a mile away from where she was living. So then I quite regularly saw her around and we started to meet up a little bit and we just, yeah. And I, and so then funny enough, I was supposed to be racing Ironman Brazil that year uh, in May. And I think maybe a week before the, uh, the race, I had to go up to LA to get a visa to go to Brazil. Okay. I go up to LA for the day, get my visa, come back, go out for dinner and then I'm like, oh, I need to wash my jeans because or <laughs> my clothes because um, I got to go to Brazil tomorrow or the next day. Yeah. And I washed my passport. Oh my like, goodness! No, that's so before they were landing. What am I going to do? I all. can't go to Brazil. I had to cancel my flight to Brazil, which was like a day or two away. Mm. And I'd told Beth in the meantime, I'm like, yeah, you should go to Ironman Cairns in Australia. That would be a great race for you. You get to experience Australia. Um, and then all of a sudden I was faced with the prospect, well, I can't do my Ironman that I was going to do in Brazil. So why not go back to home to Australia? Because I don't have a passport now. I had to quickly get a new passport. Oh wow. And I essentially just hopped in on 
crashed Beth's party at, at Ironman Cairns and wow. I guess took it upon myself to be her tour guide in Australia. And then I guess from that point on, yeah, the rest is history. We sort of started hanging out a lot more. We, sure. we yeah, so that's how we met. So obviously you connected on triathlon and I'm sure yeah. you just saw her goddess figure with the quads and all that <laughs> and you just like you were just really pulled in but yeah. what was it outside of triathlon that drew you to beth yeah well the funny thing was is at the time she was working as a school psychologist so i actually didn't see her that much because okay. she uh um, college route yeah she was um she was working nine to five every day and so like i'd see her at the ymca at swim practice where mm-hmm. we'd both swim this is before we were dating um sure. um you know i'd see her out running or something maybe but i mean there was a quite a while until we actually started hanging out a lot together because she she had this school psychology job but uh when we got back from the race in cairns where she did quite well um she had i think it was coming into the summer break or something sure and i said you should give this this sport a a proper go you're racing professionally but you're you're not able to train like a half bacon you've got a job Mm-hmm. So I can, well, she asked, requested for a leave of absence from, from work and, um, yeah, joined me on the circuit, I guess. And so then, yeah, she would join me on training camps and yeah, that's how that evolved. But uh, the funny side story to that, I guess, yeah, I mean, yeah it's funny. Um, <laughs> I'll let you not know. too long into the journey, um, we found out that Beth was pregnant. Oh, so snap. Our firstborn daughter. Okay. Went. That, that so accelerates a little bit. We found this out right. She'd just done Ironman Wisconsin. She came second there, but she was quite sick during the race. Mm. She couldn't quite figure it out. She's like, I'm never, you know, my nutrition's never mm. a problem. Yeah, baby um, on board. What's going on here? And so I was already out in Kona training for, for Hawaii that year. And she joined me out there and she's like, I don't think things are quite right. And so... A few days before the race in Kona, she she did a pregnancy test and found out that she was pregnant. Wow. So, um, talk so about a pregnant. massive hormonal boost, I guess, for me. Yeah. Uh, going into my biggest race of the year. And yeah, ultimately, I finished second that year. So I, I think it might have given you might have worked, edge. But yeah, I had, I had something to race for that day for sure. But yeah. Um, yeah. So her leave, leave of absence from work was sort of. Yeah, it wasn't. It was planned that she was going to race a season of professional triathlon. She ended up uh, carrying Win around for yeah. the next nine months. How, how old is Win again? Yeah, uh, so she's about to turn ten. She's about to turn ten. Oh man, yeah. I remember turning ten. That was a big yeah. deal. Yeah, that's so, wild. Um, yeah, I'm excited this afternoon. Um, heading back up to LA to pick them up off a flight, and then. Uh, I guess this podcast will come out after it, but um, we're yeah. going to take him to Disneyland, which is oh, great. cool. So, oh, good I'll deal. That. <laughs> is that the fir- first time for all the family? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, it's definitely not about us, that one, obviously. Sure. I think just, you know, we've got a 10 and a six year old, oh, nine and a six year old. So, yeah. um, that'll be, that'll be fun tomorrow yeah. to spend the day there uh, with them when they first arrive. Yeah. So, your, your eyes immediately started to like glitter and glow when you start talking about when. Yeah. And then obviously both your children. So yeah. um, we'll come back to this point in time in a second and then we'll wrap yeah. it into the wind story. But yeah. what is it about your kids that just lights you up? Yeah, I think it's it's a really fun age right now. You know, I think that they're really finding themselves as, you know, little people and, and yeah. their interests. And um, I I fondly remember those days when I was young, you know, like trying all different sports and you know, you're, you're meeting new friends at school and, and out of school at, at, in sporting teams and things like that. And so I think, you know, we're just let, just running with it right now. And, and they're into, like I was as a child, you know, I, I now have a great appreciation for what my parents did as a kid. Mm. That's for sure. You know, like I didn't really at the time process, like the hours that they put in commuting to and from all sorts of sporting events, you know, we were yeah. kids in the country too. So we had to travel three or four hours to get to, to Sydney for a major sporting wow. event. So, and we were doing that on the regular. And so, wow. you know, now, you know, come full circle, you know, I'm where my dad was, you know, 30 something years ago raising yeah. me. Um, I just, I'm actually really thriving in it and loving it. And I'm, I'm, 
I'm super glad that it's come in a time in my life where, you know, I'm post retirement from triathlon, but I've also, you know, our business has gotten to a stage two where, um, you know, we've got a really good staff around us as well. And so like, I think it allows us to have these little moments where we can, you know, focus on the kids and we're not always away. Yeah. Um, you know, Cause we are, we are away a lot for work and we do have a great support network around us to, to look after the girls if we are away for a triathlon, but yeah. at the same time, it's like times like this where, you know, this week we're going to take them skiing and for Marlo, it'll be her first time skiing. Oh man, that'll be so, awesome. It takes you know, a video. Those little first time moments are really special. And yeah. Um, yeah, we've just come off a summer in Australia. You know, they, they love things like junior guards, which we call nippers in Australia. So mm -hmm. just watching them in the ocean and learning to surf and uh, they're dancing. Like they just absolutely love dancing right now. And it, there's not a night that goes by that, you know, after dinner, there's a, there's not a, 20 minute dance performance that goes on so that's great do you join yeah. them pardon do you join them in the Absolutely dance party not. no no I'm, no i just judge yeah <laughs> I, I'm, I just rate it out of 10 but uh yeah it's um it definitely there's been you know we have guests that come and you know like i said daniel's there at the moment and mm -hmm. daniel was the um I guess the guest of honor at the the latest dance recital we had at dinner. That's so cool. every every triathlete that comes and stays with us in Noosa has been uh, subject to Win and Marlowe's dance routines after yeah. dinner. That's neat. That's yeah. cool. I, I doubt Daniel would put that in his video, but that's too bad. That'd be fun <laughs> to see. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so going back uh, in like the meeting of Beth, you guys have built this relationship. You're having a child together. Uh, I have a a deeper question for you, if you don't mind me asking. Mm -hmm. So you went through a divorce before, mm -hmm. and then you're moving into this relationship. So how did you find healing? And at what point did you find healing to kind of like let those things, I mean, I guess you never truly let them go, but to move forward with a healthy mindset and like this new relationship? Yeah. Um, I think at that time, you know, I, I, yeah, like you, I was alluding to before, I was quite lost at the start of 2013. And, um, you know, typically that's a time where I'm at home in Australia. It's summer, like it's, yeah, this time of year. It's like, I love being at home in Australia, but I just didn't want to be there that in, in this instance. So yeah, I found a home here in San Diego. And um, I think what ultimately led to great performances for me later in the year was just a full year of uh, dedicated focus to nothing but putting all my energies into my triathlon training. Mm -hmm. So there was some very long, lonely, soul-searching rides out mm -hmm. the back of San Diego um, that happened early in 2013 that, um, you know, at the time, you know, some days they were, uh, there was aggression in those rides and intent and there's other days where I just remember riding somewhere and sitting at a coffee shop for like two hours thinking like, what am I doing? And so it was a little up and down, but eventually I think um, once I started to hit my groove and and get into some shape and then started to ha started having some race results and just 100% focusing on, on that and not, you know, what had happened at the time, I think it, it really just set the path forward. So, yeah, I guess, and then it wasn't too much after that, like, three or four months after that, that, you know, I obviously started hanging out with Beth and I guess that added more fuel to the fire, you know, someone to, uh, someone to impress at that stage, I guess. So, sure. um, and someone that wanted to be with me. So yeah. I think that was, yeah, I think that those were the things that helped that situation and, um, it all ended up for the better. Yeah. yeah. It's always amazing to me. Um, the the benefits of swimming, biking, running, whatever your exercise is, um, not just obviously physically, but mentally for being able to process things. So I've been on a bit of this mental health journey myself, just with some some baggage I have from younger years. And one recent thing that kind of has struck me is with swimming, biking, and running, we have bilateral stimulation. So we're using both parts of our body, mm -hmm. like both sides, and then we're it's using up quite a, a quite a lot of both sides of the brain for processing and then it's what's interesting is in therapy world and i've talked about this before on the podcast so forgive me if you've already heard it but um 
EMDR therapy is basically using bilateral stimula- stimulation to process old traumatic or whatever the process is that you weren't going to go through and allows you to kind of go through that memory and get at it in a deeper way mentally. Mm-hmm. So I think that there's really something there that honestly yeah. should probably be coined within triathlon it's that you could market it because it's so good for, <laughs> like you're saying, going out three hours, you know, you're not listening triathlon to music or therapy. anything else. Yeah. You've got something to, <laughs> something to process, like spinning yeah. those out. Cause you said aggression, feeling a little lost. Like yeah. there's the, all these stages of grief. You go through anger, yeah. resentment. That's what it was like. Yeah. You yeah. have your good days and your bad days. And I guess people have all sorts of, uh, things come and go in their life that, that happen yeah. like that, that you just alluded to. So, yeah, I think triathlon is, yeah, the ultimate therapy, I think. And, yeah. 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 I have to agree. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing some of that. Mm-hmm. Um, so going back a little bit, uh, or I guess going forward some, um, when Republic, you started this company and you came up with the name, obviously, after your daughter. Yeah. Were there any other name choices and why did you end up settling on this one? Well, that's a funny one. And Beth's better to tell this story. But initially, I came up with the name Aero, which obviously the the combination of Aero and Kangaroo, where I'm yeah. from in Australia, yeah. I guess. But she didn't like that one. And so, <laughs> yeah, the marketing genius that is Beth came up with the name, the logo. Um, and yeah, I guess the, more of the, the deeper meaning to, to Win Republic. And so... Um, you know, bringing our daughter's name into it, uh, mm-hmm. it gave that some real true meaning um, and the Republic being, you know, our community that we wanted to create. And so, um, you know, born here in the USA and raised in Australia is sort of what our brand, our, you know, what our brand story has been. And so it was quite fitting. Yeah. Yeah. How do you think that this will impact when as she grows to know that her father started a company after her name because i know of yeah. some other companies that this happened with but yeah I'd love to hear what you yeah think. it's it's interesting because she's definitely a fan of triathlon she she follows it but um at this stage of her life i'm not seeing that she's following it as a career choice so yeah, yeah it'd be interesting to see you know in the in the future whether she's interested in in the family business or if we're even still involved in the family business. Yeah. But I guess, um, yeah, time will tell. Um, but yeah, she's, she's definitely, uh, she definitely loves seeing a name out there on yeah. the, on the kit. And, and it's a fun game, you know, especially if we go somewhere where, where, where we see a kit on a cyclist or a yeah, triathlete, in the wild. you know, when in the wild, you know, so point it out and yeah, puffs yeah. a little chest out. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm excited for that. Cause I, so I, Obviously, not many children have that experience, but also a lot of kids don't have the experience of having a loving mother and father who kind of support them and and getting them out there in the world and, you know, giving them the best opportunities possible. So I can only imagine it's going to be a positive thing for her. She gets older just to know that her dad and mom loved her enough to name something that, you know, because oftentimes in entrepreneurship, entrepreneurs, founders call their businesses their baby. So you've got yeah. two babies here, a baby within a baby. So it's a neat thing. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure that no, I'll it's, it's definitely a life. great environment to, you know, a very positive environment for, for a child to grow up around. And, you know, that's what got me into the sport. I was, I was going out to Ironman Australia as an eight year old. So, um, you know, to be able to give them an opportunity just to see, um, you know, how people are taking on this great challenge and, and the emotions that it can stir up, I think mm. is something quite special for kids to witness. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. So with Beth, you've talked about her a number of times um, and just her marketing ability. She's a partner in the business. That's not an easy thing to do in any partnership. Um, or you guys are married now? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So we yeah. were married in uh, 2015. Okay, so, so, so yeah. it's happened. Like, you're there. Yeah. So how has this affected... It's built up, <laughs> shaken, <laughs> shifted your marriage. Um, and because as business partners and then marriage partners, like you're taking a lot of stuff back to the bedroom with you. So I'm curious, like, how's that been? Yeah, there's no, there's no off switch, is there? I mean, I guess that you're either in business mode or you're in family mode. So sure. yeah, it's, it's a tough one. And I think we do a good job, you know, I think, and I think Beth would probably attest to this maybe in, even in the last two years especially and maybe even this year especially I've really I've really developed skills that I think I didn't have until now that I think really were um 
I guess roadblocks for us with the way we work together. But like, I think we've got we've we've got it down now. We've sort of got a system in place, and uh, she still tends to work from home uh, mm-hmm. a lot, and I go into the office uh, in Noosa and sort of manage the team there. And so not being on top of each other day in, day out, I think has really helped us there. Whereas we were around each other 24 seven. And, you know, if we're bringing that um, marital sort of um, um, relationship into the, into the office, I think that also is probably not for the best Sure. Uh, in every situation. So, you know, we try and limit that. And I think that that makes the times where we are in the office a bit more intentional as well. Mm-hmm. And we're able to work better, um, you know, in, in those circumstances. So, yeah, I think it's just been a, a way of like figuring out how we best work together. And, and we've definitely, I feel, found that groove, especially in 23, 24. It's like it's been, um, you know, now we've been able to delegate a lot more of the jobs within the within the company as well um, to take some stress off our plate. I think has been yeah. something that has been quite quite pivotal for us because yeah, when when you're a bootstrap business and you're just taking on absolutely everything, mm-hmm. um, you know, from from the website to the product development to you know the Everything, all sorts of things. Accounting. You know, it's just it's yeah. it's too much. The finances, yeah. you know, all mm. sorts of things. It's just um it, it really needs to you need to delegate. And I think that now that we've been able to do that, it's also to it's relieved the stress in the relationship. Yeah, for sure. That's good. Yeah. yeah. Well, so I you guys are going on, I guess, nine years, maybe ten years now if you pass that mark. Um yeah. I've been married for almost seven and we've been through some nice. pretty big ups and downs. Yeah. Um, and it's every time just created a new level of, and we're a bit younger, so a, a new level of awareness and trust and love and security, I think, in the relationship. So I'm sure you guys are experiencing that more and more. And yeah, now that you can delegate and kind of take a little deep breath and focus a little more on other things of life, I'm sure that feels good. I mean, I mean, the the more you grow, the more problems you, you're going to have ultimately, yeah, sure. aren't you? So I think like they never truly go away, but I think, you know, now we've got a really great team around us. You know, we don't feel like, everything rests on our shoulders now. Like, I think that, you know, we've got people that are more than capable to, to take on the big tasks, which yeah. is great. Yeah. hundred percent. So with when growing, how many people are on your team now? So we've got four here in the U S office where I am okay. today and we've got four in the Australian office as well. So, All right, cool. um, yeah, I mean, it's a small team, but, um, yeah, we, we get on so great. And I think that the one thing that strikes me, amongst our group is we, we all truly do have a passion and love for the sport of triathlon. We've all sort of dabbled in it in some way, you know, myself, it was my life. Um, but you know, all of our employees that we, we have, have, have some good knowledge of the sport. They love the sport. They're interested in the sport. And I think that that's something that's quite helpful as well. So, um, you know, not not necessarily by design, but I guess that you attract what you're around, right? And so I think yeah. that being, um, you know, in that in that space, I think obviously we've attracted people that are wanting to be in the industry and to be part of the sport. Yeah, I'm sold. Will you hire me? <laughs> uh, yeah, come on board. What do you, what do you can be. Uh, Head of media or something like that, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I'll talk to you off air. Uh, so I'm yeah. curious uh, on that topic with manufacturing. Um, that's a whole thing in itself. So are you doing like contract manufacturing? Or are you working directly with it? Yeah. Yeah. So we contract manufacture and we, we have several factories that um, that manufacture our gear. But I think that, that hasn't been without its um, ups and downs, like a lot of uh, apparel or even triathlon bicycle industry people will tell you, you know, the last couple of years have been up and down, but you know, we, we have good relationships with our factories. And I think that that's, you know, something that uh, will be an ongoing thing to manage and that only Beth and I can truly manage really as the, as the touch point there. But um, I enjoy that process. I love the R and D. I love the development. You know, we just came off a really big, heavy development stage um in the last few months and i'm really happy with where our direction's heading right now with some of our new products that you're going to start to see filter into our line so Sweet. um i think that's like getting back to like the delegation thing i think for a while uh, I, I wasn't afforded the time to be able to 
to really pursue that because of having to, you know, put out fires in other areas of the business. And yeah, so like sure. now to be able to truly get back to that, you know, developing good, yeah. good product is like where I'm truly happy. Yeah, 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 for sure. It's a fun part of the business. So yeah. as this journey has continued and you started this company and now it has, I mean, arguably international recognition, especially within our niche, how has that affected the way that you view yourself? Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting because um, like we get back to when you were asking me if I was more an introverted or extroverted leader, I think, you know, like I don't necessarily carry myself with great confidence that like, you know, we're going to be this global juggernaut brand or whatever. It's like, it's just naturally evolved that way. But like, I'm definitely passionate and growing it globally right now. And I think that that's something that has probably started to hit its stride just even in the last 18 months or so, I think, you know, working with some of the high profile athletes that we've brought on board has brought a little bit more international global recognition and being able to, you know, start to emerge in the, in the bigger markets, um, you know, like Europe, especially we're, we're going into Asia in the next month. Um, so yeah. just being able to expand outside of Australia and, and the U S where we're, where we're, you know, really focused our, in our infancy, I think that's something that's, it's excited me because it's like, you know, starting a new chapter and, um, you know, I guess, you know, you always want to see yourself growing. And I think that's some a, a part of me that continues to grow is to have that confidence to just pull the trigger and like, let's do this and, and let's go, f- go for bigger and, and broader and bolder. And yeah, um, yeah, and I'm enjoying that right now. So that kind of leads me to the next question then um, on leadership and the way that you're kind of building this culture that is being permeated through obviously your brand and then the interactions you have with your employees and then the people outside of the business in the real world. What are the values that you hold and that you try to exude? Are, is there a list of tenants or ideas and values or is it something you just kind of, it's unspoken? Yeah, I mean, I think trust is obviously one that's, uh, one that comes to mind, you know, I think for a long time, one of the things about being a, an owner of a bootstrap company is like, you're so passionate about your project that like, it is hard to get delegate and trust in people in, because it's, it's your baby. But I think at the end of the day too, I think there's always someone that's better qualified for a particular role, um, that might, you might be able to delegate in that position. Mm. Trust, I think is definitely something that you know, I've had to overcome and I'm accepting of now. Um, yeah, I think, you know, we have, I would like to say we have real, a, a real uh, caring, kind, loyal group of, uh, of people that are involved with Win Republic, whether it's our staff or our athletes. I think like they come to us not only because, um, I think they come to us because, they can see our passion in the sport of triathlon and we're truly there on the sidelines living it. You know, like I've been there, I've been Mm -hmm. part of the sport and I think we're quite unique in the the sense that, you know, Beth and I now in our retirement, we're still traveling and going to the events and we're on the sidelines and you'll find us out in the energy lab on the day of Kona, Mm -hmm. like screaming at our athletes. Like we live it, we love it. And I think, you know, that they're probably some of, yeah, there's probably some of the traits that I think that that I I think me personally and the business would just, you know, would like to promote, I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah great answer. Trust. I like trust. <laughs> that that's a huge thing for me. Um and I had yeah. to learn that yeah, from a, a young age. I remember I'm such like a control freak. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah. I, I remember trying to teach my youngest sister how to ride a bike for the first time and I don't know. I just had such a hard time. Like I had this weird belief that like only I could do things and then trying to teach her how to ride a bike was the worst thing ever. Cause I just, yeah. I realized that my lack of belief that she could do it to pedal the pedals eventually to get strong enough, like really pushed onto her. And it was at that young age, I think I was like 16 or 17. I realized like, man, I got to yeah. change this. Cause if I carry that into like adult conversations yeah. and, and working with people that I want to try to help lead or vice versa, like a belief in someone and trust in someone gives them the ultimate permission and I yeah. think boost well, to go. And make that you were able happen. to catch that at quite a young age though. Yeah. It yeah. bothered me. 
Yeah. It really did because I knew because I had this other mindset. I was like, oh, if I just had, you know, I played soccer. It's like if I just had 10 other of me, then it would be a perfect team. And I was like, why? <laughs> That's probably not right. That's like, the way to think about it. Yeah. <laughs> it's so bad. Yeah. Um, oh, good catch. Yeah. 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 Thank you. I had a lot of good mentors who I think had planted a lot of seeds. Yeah. Um, which leads me to another question for you. Like, what has been, or who, excuse me, has been your biggest like mentor, mentor and sounding board? Over yeah, this um, career. I mean, my ultimate mentor and sounding board has always from day one been my dad. Yeah. I mean, he's the one that, um, yeah, got me into the sport, um, sacrificed a lot. Um, mm. Yeah. And uh, you can probably see that it gets me pretty emotional. Yeah, I think um, that's awesome. Yeah, but um, people... I mean, obviously my mom and my dad, my, my mom has been there as well. Um, and you, you think that their belief in me from, from whether it was um, trying a new sport to pursuing triathlon and now um, raising a family and pursuing business opportunities, I think they've never been a, anything but supportive. Um, as mentors, um, you know, dad, I think really instilled a lot of, um, you know, great qualities that I think that he could pass down to me that I think, you know, I, I noticed and I think that I tried to implement um, as a father, as a business owner, as a friend. Um, yeah, all those things. I think um, when it came to triathlon, I think one of my bigger mentors, as I mentioned, uh, was a good friend, Craig Alexander. I lived with him for many years and and grew up sort of under his sort of, under his wing as like essentially like a big brother to me. Yeah. Uh, he brought me um, over to the States and um, along with McKeely Jones, were both very pivotal in my development as a professional triathlete. Um, and then, yeah, I guess later in life, I've been lucky enough to have the opportunities to um, have great mentors in, you know, developing business and the mindset that goes into that. And I think one of the ones that really um, was a turning point for me was uh, a sponsor of mine um, and ultimately led to us creating the Island House Triathlon. But Mark Holowesco was someone mm. that I really admired and, and he really passed on a lot of, you know, a lot of his knowledge to me and like how I'm going to make this next step meaningful uh as in as i transition out of my career as an athlete and into the the world of business and so yeah i guess i've i've had several great mentors along the way that have really led me to where i am now yeah you carry a very mr miyagi i don't know if you can get that reference but you know who Mr. Miyagi is? Yeah, out of yeah. Karate Kid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you carry a very <laughs> Mr. I cannot grow a ghost yeah. in the life of me, but I don't know how how, how you come to that. I'm, I feel like I'm more like the the um, what's his name? The, the I forget his name too. Daniel Sun. Daniel Sun. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just like this guy just hacking away trying to have yeah. a crack. <laughs> but your your demeanor kind of goes back to the Mr. Miyagi thing for me because I think the way oh. that you have explained, you know, over the past hour, a little bit of your life and the way that you carry yourself and the belief, almost not necessarily stoic because obviously you know how to show emotion, but yeah, going through and the way that you carry yourself with that very steady, this is where we're going, this is what I want to shoot for, let my actions speak louder than yeah. my words is a very good thing. So I can see why all of those people wanted to invest that time in you, your dad, Craig Alexander, yeah. the oh. other names you mentioned. So Yeah, oh, yeah. thanks. Yeah. I definitely don't think I <laughs> uh, have the qualities of Mr. Miyagi, but yeah, love why? Well, <laughs> for coming from a 31 year old who's trying to figure his way out in life it, that's how it impacted me so oh, mate. i mean yeah i mean yeah i'm 42 now i think you know you only gain more um there's a, there's always something to learn and always some someone to to lean on to for advice so i think mm -hmm. that's one thing that you know like you'll find seth at 31 is going to be you know, someone totally different to Seth at 41, you know, you're always constantly evolving as a human, you know? Yeah, I yeah. hope so. That's what, that's, that's my greatest hope. Or if not, I'm yeah. dying. 
Well, I think the cool thing too is you've got this podcast and you're listening to so many great stories and you're taking so many little snippets away from mm. all these people that you can draw from. So yeah, um, yeah, I, I can't wait to see where where you end up with uh, in your life's journey. You know, from just having all these awesome conversations. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. I'll just take a minute to tell you this story um, because of what you said reminded me of it. When I was in college, I started my first little company called Sway. We made instead of camping hammocks and they had them made in China and I went back and forth and did that whole product development thing and it ended up going belly up in COVID. But during that time, because I was in college, uh, I started networking a ton in Chattanooga, Tennessee and people would just pass me off. And I think it was partly because I was a really young, passionate yeah. Blinded by still, naivete. Yeah. Like yeah, pushing they, out there. They saw something in you and they wanted to invest. And, I guess. Yeah. Well, and there wasn't a lot of that. I mean, uh. for the people that did, I ended up burning their money. So sadly, that's how that ended. But I had met a lot of people and I had a lot of one on one conversations. And it was, I realized looking back on it, that was the greatest value I took away from that whole experience was mm-hmm. this one on ones because I got to ask questions of these people and hear how their brains worked and the way their stories folded into their business acumen and yeah this has only been just like an extension of that and very and i've been super humbled because a lot of people have been saying yes who i never thought would say yes and it's been one of the greatest experiences even if i was to die tomorrow like i have innumerable lists of questions and answers in a catalog i can pull back on from people from who have well fantastic resumes obviously but we're just quality people who are willing to share their lives with me and it's impacted me greatly so i yeah. appreciate that well you're bringing unique conversation to the forefront as well it's like you're not just you're not just going out there and asking the cookie cutter questions a, a typical professional triathlete would get or yeah, yeah, yeah you know a business owner might get you're delving into the why and the who and the uh, mm. people love that so yeah i job. love it it's been a great thing for me yeah. Um, how much time do you have? I have a couple more questions. Right. I've got to be back at LAX by 7 p.m. and that's heaps of time. So Okay, great. So <laughs> another four hours. Um, I want to ask you some questions about your dad. Yeah. Um, cuz you obviously there's you just touched on his name and obviously something yeah. came to mind yeah. and there's a lot to go into there, but what is it about your dad that means so much like to who you are today? Yeah, I think um well, growing up as a little boy, I, you know, you always idolize, you know, when you look at your, your father and when he's leading a football team or he's quite entrenched in the local community, you know, I thought as a young boy, I, I watched how he carried himself, the way that he he was l- much loved in his community. And mm-hmm. I think, you know, I, I aspired to be like him and I think, you know, Now, in hindsight, looking on it, he put a lot of, you know, given that he was in his prime, in his 30s, and, you know, here comes his son, Luke, who wants to be carted off to the city to go do swimming carnivals or Mm. or this and that. He essentially put his life on hold or what he, you know, what his passions were on hold to afford me the opportunity to do what I do. And so, um, yeah, I think that's why I get quite emotional about it because, you know, now looking at it, you know, it's it's easy for me to do the same for my girls. Yeah. But um, I can imagine had my girls come along really? you know, five years earlier, it would have been a tough decision. Like I might mm. not have quite made it in the sport of triathlon, which then ultimately may not have led to a business in the sport of triathlon. You know, it's just like things happen in your life at various points for a reason. But I think, you know, something that comes to mind for me now reflecting on it in my adulthood is like how much sacrifice went into giving me the opportunity to do what I do. Yeah. Yeah. It, so. Your dad's still living. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. He's, uh, he lives quite close to us. And one of the reasons why we live back in Australia, actually mum and dad live just 20 minutes away from us, uh, in Noosa in Australia. And they're both retired. Like I said, dad still triathlon coaches, but, um, yeah. They were teachers for over 30 years, so high school teachers, um, and he was a football coach as well during that whole time. So, um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, now that they're able to, they're actually very involved with our daughter's upbringing, so their grandchildren's upbringing as well. Mm -hmm. So, like, if we're, uh, you know, say we go to Kona for a week, we're like, the kids can't just leave school, so they're with my parents for the week while we're in Kona and 
mom and dad essentially back to being parents again. Yeah. You know, they're they're in their mid seventies and um I think it's probably something that I think both my parents and our kids really cherish because they got that really c- close relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's super neat. I'm sure he also he if bet if he watches this or if he heard you talking about this, he may get a little emotional as well. What do you think? Yeah, he's a very emotional guy too. Yeah. Um I think one of the the cool things that I think that he was quite well known for was for his halftime speeches when he when he did um when he was a football mm. coach. They actually used to call him Ticker, um, which, you know, obviously is uh he always used to refer to to the to the heart and you know mm. playing with passion and so all these football players nicknamed him ticker so um that's awesome i think you know from the football players that i knew growing up you know I, I was at the same school that he was a football coach at and i was friends with lots of the football players even though i, I didn't play and you know they definitely um passed on, I guess, their appreciation for the impact that he had on them too as a coach. And, and some of the, um, you know, I think that's where dad comes from a quite a unique perspective in the sport of triathlon for coaching is that he may not be the most scientific coach out there, but mm-hmm. he's definitely puts a lot of thought into it and the psychology side of it as well. Mm. I mean, that's like a lot of people will always ask me, like, did your dad ever coach you? And I would say, well, no, he never directly coached me. He never set me one single swim, bike or run session. But if there was one really, uh, really crucial part of my arsenal and especially later in my Ironman career was that my dad was very close to me when it came to the psychological side mm. of the sport because it's not an easy sport. Yeah, And he would sit me down um, days leading into Kona and we would visualize the race and talk about the race. And, um, you know, I think that that was his journey as well was like to be, um, you know, involved and they were so passionate. Like they literally came out to Kona every year that I competed out there for 12 years Wow! and they lived it with us. And, you know, like, so um, it's not just, you know, the victories I did have during my Ironman career is, you know, they, they didn't just felt like they were my victories. They felt like they were our victories. Yeah. Yeah. What is your, what is the thing in life that you're most proud of? Uh, now I would say my, my two daughters for sure. Like, I, I think you go through phases of life and I've actually listened to a couple of your other podcasts and it's quite funny to listen to the progression of, um, you know, when, like if you'd asked me this 10 years ago, I would have said, oh, yeah, coming second in Kona. Yeah. But um, I guess you just have these periods of your life where that is the most important thing in your life, right? Yeah. But right now, um, I think the the one thing that's longer lasting than anything is family. And I yeah. think that, you know, where I'm really just thriving right now is just being involved with, the, you know, the milestones that our daughters mm. are taking right now and the things that they're learning and just being part of their lives. And so I'd easily say, um, my daughters, um, yeah. And then I guess just, um, I think I'm proud in the, in the sense that like my true fanship of the sport of triathlon has never died. Like I, I saw it for the first time when I was eight years old mm. and from, being that young uh, volunteer on the side of the road, watching my idols race to ultimately racing myself and then going out the other side and, and sort of being involved on the other side of the fence. Mm. You know, it's been something of a journey um, for me, but I've always like at the deep, deep down, I've just been like so passionate about the sport of triathlon. I, you know, I sit up, sit up late at night if there's a race in Europe and watch it live, like, if I'm there at the race, I'll be like running around like, you know, a 10 year old, just mm-hmm. following the race around. And I think that's something that will never die in me. Yeah. Yeah. Great answer. So the head to heart situation here, I'm hearing a lot about this using the heart first. And, you know, it's interesting because yeah. I grew up in a context actually where the religion was overshadowed and it was, it, it said like, don't use your heart. So there's a lot of like logic um driven stuff which 
I think that there's something to be said about only, you know, following, going life off your emotions. There's a time to be logical, I think. But yeah. at the sacrifice that I experienced growing up, it was a lot of the sacrificing of the heart where you're you're losing that connection with someone, which ultimately leads to bad community, but ultimately, I think, bad parenting. Like, being a dad where you can have a conversation with your child for what's going on in their heart, not not the logical conversation for why did you act out in that way or whatever? Like mm -hmm. there, there's such a nuance to that, that I don't think we, many of us got the experience to, or the, I guess the teaching or the example to know how to do that. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting just kind of processing yeah. that as you're talking. Uh, I understand that not every child has the same upbringing. And I know that, yeah, I, I, I couldn't imagine a life not being close to my family, like to my mom and my dad and my sister, um, and now my kids and my, my wife, but, yeah. um, you know, I, I, I totally can understand that some people just don't have that. And I think, yeah. um, you know, that's something that, you know, I, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't be able to speak from that experience, but I can understand how it could really impact someone as well. Yeah. 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 I guess I'm more just observing. I think it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. So if you were to give advice to someone who is going to be a father, and how to connect with your family on that level from your experience. Yeah, maybe, how we're going to get myself in too deep now. Parenting <laughs> advice, geez. I, I mean, I don't know if anyone really knows what they're doing when you're a parent. Sure. Um, like we've got two girls that got vastly different, um, you know, just looking at their, um, you know, what makes up both of our girls. Like they're, they're just so different. Um, mm -hmm. So I just don't think one particular parenting technique for one would work for the other, you know, like Wynn is just such beat of her own drum, you know, like very independent, uh, very determined, very like you can't tell her, you know, what to do whatsoever. Sure. Whereas Marlo, you know, she's very thoughtful and um, respectful and, uh, uh, you know, definitely not a rule breaker. And so like I've got this like introvert and extrovert that's like a constant juggling act to to deal with so honestly i i think you know i think being accepting of who they are as well and 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 rolling with that and i think i mean i'd like to think you know i wouldn't say that we are by any means the perfect parents but i think that mm -hmm. like we've never really um we've never really had to like um you know, get overly involved with disciplining them or, um, you know, we, I think they sort of know the what's right and what's wrong. And we sort of, we obviously try and guide that and, um, you know, help them develop those skills in those areas. But I think, um, you know, it's not something that I, you know, I don't think we're like really super hands-on parents where we're like, you know, restricting them in any way either, you know, and like, not letting them be themselves so yeah i mean i don't know if that's advice but i mean this is just an observation from, yeah from like my brief experience 10 years of experience with my two and yeah. who knows how they're going to turn out i mean I'm, yeah. I'm pretty happy with where they are where they're at at the moment but i mean we're coming into the teenage years and that i know it's just saying they're so. girls yeah so yeah. <laughs> as, as a father i i know who i was when i was yeah, a teenager I'm nervous about like, the next few years like eesh. we've actually got some local friends with some girls just that you know four or five years older and i'm like here yeah, we go it's gonna be yep strap in yeah, yeah, the values of when might change, when Republic might change. <laughs> You're yeah. going to be as trusting of all the boys that come knocking at your door. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, don't even talk about it. Uh, yeah. Well, good, man. Um, well, I have one more question for you. Um, what in, in your life right now, it can be Win Republic, it can be family, it can be all-encompassing anything. What are you working on right now that you're most excited about? Good one. Um, I'm just loving um, being part of i mean I've, I've touched on my family I, I, I obviously love being involved with my the development of my two girls and where they're going but i think when it comes to like my business i'm super super pumped about working with some of the best athletes in the world and i think you know for me being able to transition from you know aspiring and being one of those athletes and now on the flip side of that being part of their progression and their journey to try and, you know, 
reach their goals, I think that's something that um, I'm super pumped about. And I think, you know, I'd love to see a Win Republic tri suit on the top step of Kona. That would be like yeah. my my dream. And so um, I think we're not too far away from that. And I think mm. that, um, you know, my passions lie in, you know, helping the athletes be in the best kit and, and beyond that, just like being there to support them, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be in the realm of apparel, but, you know, just general advice and being there for them. I think that's something that I, I truly love and I love being part of their journey. So I think that's, mm. that's probably my answer. Yeah. Great answer. I actually do want to ask one more question. I know I already said it was the last question, but this is, I feel like this will lead into it well. Yeah. What do you want to be remembered for? Oh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess, like I said before, I think like a a true lifelong triathlon fan. Like I think um, I've progressed through so many stages of, you know, within this sport from, you know, from a kid, from a volunteer to a, from, uh, from a teenager trying to cut it to a professional, um, you know, I delved in race directing and creating events and now, um, sort of going into the business side of things with developing products. And, um, you know, I think that will never stop as well. Like, I don't think we're just ever going to stop at apparel. So I think, you know, like someone that, you know, had a quite a broad reach within the triathlon community and just didn't just come here and win a few races, like did yeah. a whole lot more and created a meaningful community. I think that's one thing that yeah. Win Republic is just this blossoming thing right now where I'm just so proud to see our community growing and seeing our team, you know, performing out there and following their journey um, through the sport is something that, you know, I can be pretty proud of. Yeah. I'm going to make you a pitch really quick. So this is, I'm going to make a pitch for, this is Luke McKenzie's um, life tagline. And I'll, I'll say it and then I'll, I'll unpack it. So yeah. I want it to be, he pursued and he loved. Maybe even take out the and. He pursued, yeah. comma, he loved. Because you're pursuing triathlon, you're pursuing that community, you're pursuing uh, personally in all the aspects of your life. And then he loved, because I keep hearing this idea thrown around or this concept of loving the athletes, being with them on that journey, loving your kids, helping them to find their way. So I feel like he pursued, he loved, probably fits well. Is that... Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, like, I, I would love to be remembered for that. That's, uh, yeah. yeah, that's there what you can put on my gravestone. Aha! Uh -huh. I was going to ask what you put on your epitaph. I'm great, <laughs> glad you said that, because that means that we're tracking. I'm not done yet, that. baby. I'm yeah. only 40, 42. I know, you got another 60 years at least. Oh, who knows? Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, Luke, it has been an honor and a pleasure to come on and walk through so much of your life uh, with you. Um, it's brought me a lot of joy and a lot of wisdom that I'm sure I'm going to chew on quite a number of things and made some notes. So thank you so much. I'm cool. sure people Thanks, love Seth. it. No, keep doing what you're doing, mate. It's really a, a great podcast and I'm really enjoying uh, listening. So keep it up. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to Luke for coming on the podcast and being so vulnerable and sharing so much about his family. Um, I had tears well up in my eyes a couple of times as he was talking about his relationship with his dad, because if you guys know, as you guys know, um, just with my background in history, and it's an amazing thing to see that those relationships do exist. And I hope one day I can create the same one with my kids. Um, so if you reach this point in the podcast, just want to say thank you so much. Uh, if you are watching or listening, wherever that is, I ask that you would please like, comment, subscribe, leave a review. Anything you can do uh, in that department really helps us to continue to grow and really appreciate that. If you would like to sign up for our newsletter, you can do that at the stupidquestions.show website. There's a link at the very top that shows join the newsletter, and there's one all the way at the bottom where you can type it in there as well. All right. I hope you guys have a wonderful day, and we will catch you in the next one. Adios.